So now let's get a little bit into the causes and, and risk factors. And basically, it, I mean, it really boils down to plaque. Just like it is in you and I, you know, we have plaque that builds up on our teeth and full of bacteria. Um, after you get a dental cleaning, so you have the scaling and polishing, that your body and the cat's body will put down a glycoprotein layer on those teeth. And that glycoprotein layer loves to collect bacteria. And bacteria love the glycoprotein layer. So you get this immediate glycoprotein layer laid down on the teeth, and then these bacteria come around, and there's a lot of wonderful bacteria in a cat mouth. Um, and it creates this biofilm, which is a really kind of a unique environment. It's really beneficial to the bacteria because it kind of gives them a safe haven to live in, and it's very difficult to just simply brush away that biofilm. It's very resistant to brushing, it's very resistant to a lot of the disinfectant techniques that are there, so it makes it very difficult um, to just go about every day and get rid of these particular bacteria. And once these bacteria are on the gum, they start, you know, they start growing and having a good time and everything. And uh, they actually, they'll move. Usually they're deposited on the crown of the tooth or what's above the gum line. But eventually they'll, they'll move down into what's underneath the gum. And that's where we start having the problems with the inflammation. Um, because those areas, it's even more protected now because it's underneath the gum where you can't really get up there and brush or you know take care of in, at a, in a home setting and those little guys just keep plugging away and and they start creating a lot of byproducts and these byproducts set off the host's immune system and the immune system starts to kick out your cytokines your prostaglandins all those wonderful white blood cells and everything and thus you get the inflammation you get the inflammation of the gums, the red line, and everything like that. And unfortunately, these, I mean, the body's trying to do what it's supposed to do and fight off those bacteria, but in the process, their byproducts tend to weaken and destroy the supporting structures of that tooth. And so you get the wearing away of the bone and the, the ligament that keeps the, the tooth attached in the, in the gum, those type of things. So it's kind of a vicious circle because you get the immune response and it's trying to help but in reality it tends to do more damage than normal and then you get tartar buildup which is nothing more than than mineralized or calcified plaque and that sticks and adheres to the that tooth and creates an even better environment for those bacteria to live because they're even more protected from that hard shell and so it's just again, it's kind of a never ending battle of continual buildup and buildup of these bacteria attacking the gums and the teeth. So you get not such a great outcome. Um, and the bad thing about tartar is you can't, that's not something you can brush away or, or get away with the um, additives and the, and the rinses and the mouth rinses and things like that. So that's something that actually has to be removed by hand. And usually a cat. There are a few, I suppose, that would let you sit there with a pair of rangiers and, and get the tartar off their teeth, but not many of them will. <laughs> Usually it's something they have to go in and, and be anesthetized for and that sort of thing, so. And as far as stomatitis, a clear etiology of why this happens isn't really there. It's unfortunately a lot like many of the diseases that we have, FIP and such. Um, we don't know why it happens. Um, we have an idea of a few things that work together. Um, we think it's probably a multifactorial type problem. And of the two, it's either they say it's an inadequate host response or an exaggerated host response. I tend to lean toward the exaggerated host response. It just, the host's body really, really relaxed, reacts to that plaque and that biofilm and it just, it the immune system just blows up and again you're making more of the products that are breaking everything down and so we get the really bad stomatitis. Um, genetics
probably play a role in environmental stress, diet, viruses probably play a pretty big role, and bacteria, of course, that's ever present in the mouth, so it's really difficult to, to get rid of. Genetics, again, we had some breed predispositions to things. Um, also, your brachycephalic breeds, so like your Persians and Himalayans with the flat faces, they have problems just because of the nature of their jaw structure and their inability to really, you know, get the, the shearing forces on their food and things to scrape, help scrape some of that plaque and things off of their teeth. And a lot of times they'll have, you know, some <laughs> malocclusions and the teeth may not be lined up perfectly. And then again, it's a never ending battle because you get a lot of that plaque built up in those areas where normally the normal bite of the animal should help scrape some of that away, but it doesn't happen because of the way that their jaw is. It, yeah. Can, is it something that you've seen past um, from household cats that aren't related at all, genetically related every day? Is that, that well, that again, that's kind yeah, of Yeah, because, okay, I had, I had a Siamese who um, first developed the stomatitis and after she passed away, an Egyptian mouth that was always close to her, and they they groomed each other a lot, mm -hmm. um, developed it. So, so you're asking, is it is it like contagious? Yeah, is it contagious? Not Can really. They spread it. Not 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 dental disease in itself. Dental disease is not contagious. Yeah. Um, you can't. You wouldn't be able to swab one cat's mouth and pick out the predominant bacteria and then swab another cat's mouth and say, oh, it's the same bacteria, so they must have passed it from one another. It's not contagious in that manner, mm -hmm. but some of the contributing factors are contagious and can, th by the you know, process of um, cohabitation and things like that, can influence getting it. So, but as far as inheritable, it's a big question mark. Um, is it in some lines? I think it's possible. I think the genetics are there for an exaggerated immune response to the animal, but I've had some litters of kittens that don't have any problem, and the mom has, you know, pretty bad gingivitis. The kittens are fine. Um, so they haven't, I mean, they haven't pin down an actual gene or anything like that, but I think that there is a little bit of an inherited response as far as the immune system. Um, if you have, I would say if you had um, a female and a male that have really, really severe dental disease, I would not put them together as a mating because probably, most likely, your kittens are going to have pretty bad dental disease as well or at least the stomatitis and things like that. But they've not actually come out and said, you know, there's an absolute inheritable component to the actual stomatitis. So it's one of those that, yeah, it's kind of up in the air. Um, environmental stress, again, stress, anything that's gonna compromise the immune system in any way <laughs> could play into a factor. Um, overcrowding, poor nutrition, um, poor hygiene, again, stressors on the cat. It's going to lower their immune system, possibly cause some of the dental problems. They're not able to fight off the bacteria and the plaque and that sort of thing. Diet, big, big debate over dry food versus wet food. Which do you feed? There are studies out there of dogs and cats that say yes if you feed a dry diet they have less incidence of plaque on their teeth than you do when you feed wet food. The kicker is the fact that it was done in both dogs and cats. Dogs tend to chew their food much much more than cats do. Cats with the small, the small little kibbles very much they don't chew and so you're not getting the scraping action and that the dry kibble actually gives as far as getting rid of the plaque is concerned so 
you know, yes, you're probably going to have more plaque buildup if you feed an all wet diet, but there are advantages to feeding an all wet diet in some cases in cats. I mean, as they get older with chronic kidney disease and things like that, you know, wet food is the way to go. Um, and just as a side note, this really doesn't have to do with dental disease, but um, I listened to a talk that said kittens are very, in the early, you know, from about three weeks to, to six weeks when they're starting to be weaned from the mom and everything like that, it's a good idea to give them an array of foods texture-wise and canned versus dry. Kittens at that early age tend to develop mouth or um, oral feelings and so the, the different textures in are good so they get used to the different textures because I know we have in the, our clinic we have a lot of problems with as the cats get older and they start having you know, chronic kidney disease problems things like that where we want them to be on a canned food and they're like oh they won't eat canned food they just they, they refuse it and a lot of that we think is because they don't get that mouth feel and texture feel as a young kitten and develop the the connect that oh this is this is okay you know I'm it's okay to eat this it's it's a normal feeling but a lot of times we think that the canned food avoidance is a texture thing because they they didn't develop that texture feel in their mouth as they were a young kitten so I've kind of started with my kittens giving them an array of different feels as far as textures of foods um, at least at an early age and then I mean and then you can decide to feed you know a dry food or, or something like that at that time but it just it makes our it makes our life a little bit easier as veterinarians when we try to get these cats onto canned food or if the case of you have one that has to have full mouth extractions and they can only eat canned food but they don't want to because they don't like the feel of it <laughs> but it's just kind of one of those things. I mean, kids is an early age. Well, if they're not exposed to a lot of different textures and stuff, later on in life, they tend to not like certain foods because they have a weird texture because they just weren't exposed to it as a young, as a young child. So well, this is the opposite side of that. <laughs> I only feed dry food. Uh -huh. I haven't had a litter born for 12 years, so I, my experience goes farther back than that. But I, I don't ever give any canned or canned wet food because I don't want them to resist the change the back food. over to all dry food. Yeah. But then I have a breed that, that can be free fed so I leave right. dry food out all mm -hmm. the time. And they don't ever even try to eat any of my food off of my plate or anything. They don't mm -hmm. beg for anything. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that people food is yeah. something you can eat. Yeah. So it could be a problem at some point. <laughs> that could but be. I have a 17 year old who's still eating the dry food and the like I said, food. they don't chew it anyway so what difference does it make? Yeah. Yeah. And I know that from when they throw it up because yeah. it's all still it's all, there. It's all, yeah, exactly, exactly. You can tell. Definitely and it is tell. very difficult sometimes when you start it out on canned food. Yeah. To get they them like to it. where they will eat just dry. Exactly. And for my exactly. purposes, that it's got to be that way. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I suggest an array. I mean, you don't have to feed exclusively, but just give them that mouthfeel of a can or, you know, and it can be the pate style and the shredded style, but just give them, because they're used to what, if they were out in the wild, mom would bring them a mouse and the mouse would be kind of crunchy, kind of squishy, <laughs> kind of furry. <laughs> furry. Yeah. And so they would get all those different textures <laughs> when they were young, if they were out in the wild, but being that they're not out in the wild and we have commercial kibble that's I mean it's gotten a little bit better as far as different ranges of textures and, and, and sizes and things like that and in smell. dry food and smells and but if they you know at an early age if they're like oh mom's only eating this and it's crunchy so I'm gonna eat it and it's crunchy that when later on when you try to give them something different they're like ooh, you know mom didn't eat this when I was little and it feels funny and but at some point, it might be beneficial to the kitty to put them on canned food or, or something of that of that line, or canned food to dry food, either way. I'm sorry, I just had a question. Yeah. Because I didn't see it on your chart, and unfortunately, I have to okay. here. For older cats, they get staining on their teeth. Yes. That's really just age and stain. Yes. Now, 
what can you do to, once when I get a, by his cane and it gets a little swollen, but I think that's his other two sometime protein. My mm -hmm. cat eats everything and everything. He's like Garfield, but, but what about that liquid stuff? They say those liquid rinse, it's like a gel. Yeah. Is that's, that good for older cats and staining? You can try. Um, it won't, staining really, you can't do anything about staining. Uh, staining, sometimes you can get it off with a dental cleaning, but a lot of times you don't. Staining is just permanent staining of the tooth. But it, it doesn't affect them as far as their dental health. It doesn't cause any problems. It's just the actual staining pigmentation of yeah, the teeth. Yeah, they're gummed a little bit. They said it's nothing because I've had it checked out. Yeah, but yeah. it's just aged. The, I call it some call it just aged stuff. But would that stuff? Um, it's really not going to do a whole lot for staining purposes, but it might help remove some of the plaque. And there's no long-term yeah. effects using that. Um, usually not. Um, I've, I'm going to touch on it a little bit here, yeah, just a little bit. Same. But yeah, I mean, it's it's. There Just shouldn't be any long term. Be swallowing it, like, it's so small. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you're dumping it down their throat or they're ingesting a whole lot of it. As long as they don't ingest a, a, a significant amount of it, then okay. it should be fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but we have seen some innovations in the dry food. So we do have some bigger kibble now. Um, Royal Canine Maine Coon is a little bit larger kibble. My guys tend to chew it a little bit more than some other kibbles, but most of the part, they just swallow it. So yes, dry food does help with dental disease, but it's not the be all end all as far as cats are concerned. Um, viral, uh, feline leukemia virus and feline immunodeficiency virus um, seem to be pretty prevalent in cat, cats with dental disease. But we're not saying that dental disease causes FELUC and FIV. It's just more of their immunocompromised status, which both of these viruses tend to do. It knocks out the immune system, yeah. causes them to have dental disease. So from a veterinarian standpoint, when we have these newly adopted kittens from the shelters and things like that, we always suggest that they have them feline leukemia tested and FIV tested. Or if we have a cat that we've never seen before, come in suddenly with horrible, horrible dental disease, and we don't know their feline leukemia FIV status, we would suggest that they test for it. Again, in cattery situations, that's usually not an issue because most people test their feline, you know, anyone coming into the house that's new, or they know the status of their cats already. So feline leukemia and FIV is more of a general population type problem. And again, it's more of the immunocompromised status of the animal versus the dental disease caused the virus. That's, that's not the way it goes. Um, for quite a few years, the Bartonella, or the back, uh, virus that causes cat scratch fever, um, was thought to play a role in dental disease and, and the very bad uh, stomatitis. Um, but as of late, they've seen several cats that have horrible, horrible, horrible mouths that don't have any titers at all. And we have some cats that have really, really high titers, don't have any disease, mouth disease at all. So um, it's more of, I guess, of a public health issue because this is a zoonotic disease. It can be transferred from cats to humans. So they wanted people to know what their status were so they make sure that they could protect themselves against getting this disease and get the cat treated. It's a very, very treatable disease, Bartonella, put him on doxycyclin for a little while and takes care of the problem. Um, Khaleesi virus, however, in just recent, the most recent studies has been shown to play probably the most significant part as far as a viral component of uh, oral disease and, and stomatitis and things like that. 97% uh, of cats in one study with chronic stomatitis were shedding fairly high levels of Khaleesi virus. So, and again, that's kind of goes back to the environmental stress and everything too, you know, overcrowding. And if you have a disease going through your cattery and stressing everybody out and things like that uh, will have an impact on their oral health as well. And herpes virus may kind of do a syn synergistic role with Khaleesi virus to cause, again, you're knocking out the immune system and causing some of that mouth inflammation. So Khaleesi really has kind of come to the forefront as far as one of the main viral components um, of stomatitis and dental disease in cats. 
Bacterial, again, like I said, the mouths are full of bacteria and you can't get away from that, unfortunately. <laughs> There's no sterilization of the mouth that we can do to really help get rid of this for the cats, but we can put them on antibiotics. Um, Pasteurel and Pseudomonas are probably the most common and, and the worst bacteria that's in the mouth. That's why if you ever get bit by a cat, you, know, you go to the doctor right away because that's those are some pretty nasty bacteria that can get in there. Um, and then just general health too. Um, any other systemic diseases can contribute to oral disease. Uh, so if you have diabetes, hyperthyroidism, um, anything like that that's going to cause any type of a uh, hazard to the immune system can play a part in uh, dental disease as well. So. Tooth resorption again, they don't exactly know why it happens. Um, older cats tend to get more. Diet, they thought for a little while, might play control play a role in higher magnesium diets that are in commercial foods, they thought might have um, a role, but it's not really been conclusive. Um, heroes of late in the last few years they thought excessive vitamin D um, and that again it has to do with bringing the domestication of the cat basically bringing the cat indoors feeding them these commercial diets that have a higher content of vitamin D they thought that excess excessive vitamin D actually upregulates the odontoclasts which are the cells that, that destroy bone and destroy an animal and that sort of thing on the teeth. So you're getting higher vitamin D, it's kicking in those odontoclasts and they're chewing up the teeth and causing the resorptive lesions. But the studies have, again, have been kind of inconclusive. They're counter, counter indicative. One says that yes, it does have a role. The next one says no, it really doesn't have a role at all. So again, they don't know. Domestication, exclusively indoor cats, they think might play a role because the, of the the feral cats that they've looked at in studies don't tend to have as many tooth resorptions as indoor cats. So, but they don't know how it really plays a role, but unless it's nutrition, could be. Well, what I'm wondering is, since the feral cats have such a short lifespan, that's, that could be it too, exactly. And oranges, exactly, you know, that could be too. It could be that we're just, they don't we're, have we're seeing cats tests. age more yeah. being inside, so we're seeing more of them. And that yeah. very well could be exactly what is going on, kind of too. The study a little bit. Yeah. And one study said neutering, neutering <laughs> and spaying played a role. They really couldn't come up with a good reason why that, but that was one thing that was thrown out there as well. Different hormones. So, yeah. so different like hormones, the, yeah, the exactly. Sexes, so exactly, different hormones, but I mean, they weren't able to conclusively say, oh yes, it was neutering does this. So again, tooth is it's really a multifactorial issue as far as cats are concerned. So everything plays its part.